Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all good. The usual, the usual. You're on mute, Christian. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. Um, cool. You want me to kick off? Yeah, let's kick it uh, away. Yes. All right. Woman Napa Malinyara, Shagabu Mianga, Christian, Manaru, Warrang. You're a Gadigal. So just acknowledge that uh, my name's Christian from Yerubingan. So you're yeah, Yerubingan coming from Gadigal country. Um, and welcome you here today um, on behalf of my mob. And then also paying our respects to the land we walk on today and also the beautiful produce that we're going to discuss that comes from their country. Um, so um, yeah, Yerubingan, just to let you know, the company's name comes from my grandmother's language and it means we walk together. And I think the great thing about about food and sharing knowledge around native foods is, is that's also that we eat together is probably another great way today so lovely to have you here and also believe it, after us tracy's going to be cooking up some amazing feasts for you showing you how you can use native foods but today we're going to walk you through our cultural landscape garden here at south everly and show you some of the amazing species we have here and the species that you can use and you can also grow in your, in your own in your own space Barb, have you got any questions for me you want to kick off Okay, well, Christian, I will just start off by welcoming everyone um, to the Nutrition Week. Um, grow well, grow, um, eat well, and save well is our theme. And we are working behind the scenes with Nutrition Australia, and our theme is My Plate, My Planet, um, and Purify. So, My Plate, My Planet inspires each one of us um, to fill our plate. Um, with sustainable um, and um, sorry guys, can you hear the background noise or are you right? Someone banging a hammer. <laughs> sustainably grown food, vegetables and nutritious food through, uh, through economical shopping and cooking to improve the health of, the, of our soils and our environment. And we will be looking at this garden um, with Christian who is the founder and we're very delighted that they have um, given us the opportunity to, to bring the garden to you today. Um, Christian, I might just kick off with what inspired you. You talked about your grandmother and all of that. How did the garden come about? Um, well, we worked with um, the project managers here in Mervac, and this space here originally was just a, just a grassed area. And I suppose the idea was, is how could we develop something with the Aboriginal community that could help share knowledge around cultural landscape management, um, business knowledge around plants, but then also look to see more biodiversity being brought into the landscape. So that was sort of the inspiration for this. Um, this garden was co-designed with Red, Redfern local community. And what we did was unlike normal gardens, it was designed around what could the community use it for, how could the space be experienced. And integral for that was learning about, learning about native foods. So um, that's been the inspiration around it, but also sustainable, um, the sustainability of native, native foods and native plants and the fact that, you know, that we don't, it's all organic, we don't use pesticides, native, native plants need less water, they're more adapted to the, to the environment and also very rich because of our old and in many ways quite harsh landscape, they're very rich um, and diverse in uh, flavours, but also in their nutrients as well. All right, terrific. Well, let's get started then. All right, cool. Um, so, look, two, two, two plants I've got here in my hand that we don't have in the garden, but are just across the, across the way. Uh, and probably many of you are familiar with a fantastic plant, um, lemon myrtle. There are a whole bunch of culinary myrtles. Lemon myrtle, you can get a cinnamon myrtle, curry myrtle, all, all amazing, have amazing properties. Um, this one gets used in all sorts of stuff, but also as a mild um, antiseptic which is interesting because we eat it um, but again you know food is medicine so if you if you actually take one of the leaves bar the best thing to do is actually break it or smack it to release the oils and then you'll get more of the more of the smell with the smell of vision mm. yeah yeah so it's look really nice. nice in your nice in your g and t um i make i make lemon myrtle margaritas actually that's my my favorite ones to use these for but yeah it get used as a cordial and Anything that you get that nice zesty lemon flavour, you can use it, use it for cooking. Um, and this one, some you may be familiar with as well, is, is paperbark. Now, paperbark is really an amazing, amazing um, plant. Um, often gets used the, as, as like bandage, um, bedding. But one of the things it's fantastic for is, is cooking fish in the coals and wrapping fish 
in this. So, and then often then you can add your spices into it and then also put it in the fire and then bake it in, bake it in these. So sort of make them like up into a package. Similar to many other species, you use banana leaves, you know, you can, but this is, this is, this is the, the, the local trick, shall we say. So look, we might start on one plant we've just got here. And this is what's known as femida or kangaroo grass. And for those of you familiar with, with Bruce Pascoe's um, book, maybe familiar with this, this species, it's a species that's used for bread making. So indigenous bread making is something that we're very much looking into. And so are a number of people around the use of native, native seeds to make, um, to make flour. So probably something that's not traditionally thought of with, with um, First Nations people is, is bread making is something that's quite integral and, and as has many um, local variants in species that they use. So in South Australia, they very much use seeds from saltbush, which we also have here. So yeah, so bread making. So I think people traditionally think about indigenous foods being fruits, but we're very much looking at um, broadening that palate. Um, down here is what we call a midgen berry. Now this um, is just starting to flower, as you can see. Um, it gets these beautiful little blueberry size uh, fruit on them. They have this real cinnamon sort of latte taste is the way I describe them. They look, they look like on the outside, they look like a bit like a quail's egg, so all speckledy, but like the size of a blueberry. Very rich, very rich in vitamin C as well, as are a lot of the fruits. Um, normally we use them just to cook, pick them and eat them, but they have been used in preserves. And I believe some other chefs are really trying to expand the opportunity to use them. They're very delicate. So as you pick them, they need to be used fairly quickly really easy to grow um they probably grow nearly anywhere not hugely keen on um strong salt areas but anywhere don't mind a bit of frost um really go well um oh, sorry. So next to it sorry sorry to interrupt um we've just had a question if you could um give the common name and the scientific name of the food as well if possible oh i haven't got all the scientific names on oh, me okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, if you search them Midgen, midgen, berry, midgen berries is easy. It's ostromotus. Oh, it's coming over the top of my head. But yeah, uh, lemon myrtle is uh, Bacchiaia citradora. <laughs> lemon myrtle. Some of them I haven't got the. So Themida is is kangaroo grass. Um, yeah, I haven't got all of them for you. But usually, most of these ones, because they are bush foods, you'll be able to find the the um, scientific names if you Google them. Not a problem. Thank you, Chris. All right, cool. So just in here, we have um, a number of these. What are they called? Uh, is it called a rainforest currant? They get a beautiful, rich purple um, bunch of currants on them that almost look like a um, bunch of grapes. Um, quite a strong sort of tarty taste. So, um, and you can see they have these, you can tell that they're rainforest plant because they have their plant, they have their little um, drip tips on them so that they don't get too much moisture staying on the leaves. So they've got a nice pointy end of the leaves. Um, so we've got them growing in here, uh, very, very strong. It's quite glossy, isn't it? Yeah, so big white leaves, glossy leaves, um, very much because they're a rainforest species, pretty indicative of those. Um, so we've got a few of those through there. And just in here, you probably might not recognise this one. This is a variant of Thingolon, often called a Mount White. Um, the good thing about this one is it doesn't have spines. Um, and I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with finger limes, native caviar, as they get called, those beautiful translucent balls that, that, that grow, grow inside um, those amazing fruit. Again, a rainforest species has become very commercial. Um, I particularly like uh, finger limes using them for fish, um, but then also have used them in pesto with horrible greens and things like that. So, but I mean, for those who are familiar with them, the other thing that they're fantastic on is fresh oysters with a dash of tequila and Tabasco too, if you uh, if you're, that's a, that's a special for me, if, you're, if you like your oysters like I do. Um, so we'll come along, we've got, got quite a bit of, this is what's sometimes called sea celery. It's quite, um, quite peppery. It's got a sort of a, so if you look at that, really good obviously as a, as, as a salad additive. Um, I think it's used in so many different ways actually, so, but, um, and you'll see, see you next to it, fan flowers. One of the most important things about our garden design is, is that we have multiple um, pollinators. Um, none of this stuff will grow properly without all of the different insects. And essentially with the permaculture approach, native permaculture approach we, we use is all about the balance of bringing together uh, food plants with pollinating plants, because we don't want a monocultural, but also to create urban biodiversity um, and then also get the benefits of, of all of those things put together. 
Um, yep, lots of native bees. Surprisingly enough, we've got lots of native bees in Sydney, and you just need to give them the opportunity to uh, have something to flower on. So in next to it, we've got two salt bushes. This one's called the ruby salt bush, and it usually gets these, a um, little bit uh, later in the year, it'll get these beautiful little um, red fruit that have this almost taste between a capsicum and a green apple, I would describe it. That's when I always have them. Again, these are the sorts of fruits that when you were foraging, the people who were doing the foraging would actually eat as they went along to sustain themselves while they were, while they were, while they were cooking it in. We, we, I had never used the leaves, but um, when we did our collaboration with Jocks on Fellow, uh, when they had a rana here in Sydney, they were using the green tips off these for one of their recipes in their, in their pop-up here that was um, last year. So green tips off these, really easy to grow, very drought tolerant. So again, a really nice plant. You can have it in a pot on your balcony or in your kitchen garden. Um, it looks quite nice with the lovely foliage. Looks, yeah, it's very similar to a, to a coastal rosemary almost, yeah. but yeah, but the little, I mean, I, I've, I've done nothing. I've never cooked with the ruby, um, little ruby or saltbush um, fruit, but they're just great to eat. Um, and then next to it we have um, old man saltbush. So the grey leaf saltbush you're probably pretty familiar with. Um, obviously started off as a plant that was used to manage rising salt um, in rural areas, in particular in Western New South Wales. And then the story goes that a, a farmer let um, his uh, sheep out into that paddock to eat the saltbush. And then that salt bush then came into, they had their lamb the next season and realized that they had salt bush lamb. So if you've had salt bush lamb before, it is, it's fantastic. And then I think from that, many cooks such as Kyle Kong, who we've worked with and that incorporating salt bush into Asian cooking and because um, amazing properties um, that it draws salt out of the air and out of the ground. And that's had this beautiful flavor. The thing when you're using salt bush, I was, if you're gonna use it fresh, I usually fry it up quite a bit first because it is quite strong. Um, it is try, quite strong the, um, God, I can't remember the word now. <laughs> but yeah, basically to get the, get, the, get the green taste out of it. Chlorophyll, there you go. For some reason my brain wouldn't say chlorophyll. So to get the chlorophyll taste out of it, or we also dehydrate it quite uh, sharply. So um, we use that, so it's used in bread, you can ferment it. Um, really useful plant in the garden, um, but also fantastic. Um, flexibility for using to cook with. So in next to here, probably we had a group of school kids here this morning and said, have any of them eaten Australian food, native Australian food? And they all said nothing. I said, oh, you never eaten a macadamia? And they all went, yes, I've eaten macadamia. <laughs> uh, so we've got a couple of macadamias in here. So the tree's here, so this is a macadamia. Uh, really interesting tree, the way it grows. We've, I've actually got one indoors in a pot at the moment, just out of experiment. So a sunny spot, it'll sit in a pot, balcony. Um, you don't get much fruit indoors, but because of, the, because of the pollination that they need but a really interesting plant. Um, and then over here we have one that's really sprouting a lot is the um, Illawarra plum pine. And you may have come across these. Um, getting used quite a bit for fermentation in things like gins and, but I mean, just a beautiful, they get this beautiful little um, plum colored fruit that's got a black seed on top of it. Um, really strong taste, uh, very tarty almost. Um, but yeah, obviously from originally endemic to the sort of South Coast region, but does get up on the North Coast. We get them in Sydney as well. So um, a really interesting tree. Um, how tall do these grow? Big, they can get up to like eight to 10 meters. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and then sometimes even bigger and other. So you can see we've got a few more of our, so another macadamia. Um, go and show you some. So in the middle here, obviously, you know, one of the Acme and Smithy eye. I didn't know that one. Uh, of rivalry. There, are, there are so many different species of them um, and they all have a slightly different taste. Obviously really, really versatile, really versatile fruit. Um, beautiful flesh in them. This one's probably getting a bit old, yep it is. But yeah, the flesh, I mean, you can use them for anything. You can uh, preserves. We've done them, we ferment our rum for one of our um, for daiquiris, uh, things like that. But yeah, these ones are a little bit off. So I actually have these in my garden. Yeah, they're everywhere. This, you, you can literally walk down the street, street anywhere in Sydney and you'll find probably a couple of weeks ago, early spring, you'll find fruit everywhere. And I know a number of people who are pretty strong street foragers that, that go all around through Sydney, used a lot. And there's so many, so many different variants, um, a slightly different taste, but all, all in the main are, are pretty, got that similar sort of um, ribery apple. Yeah, yeah. Could you just repeat that 
um, fruit name. We just had some questions of what that fruit was called. Uh, it's Lily Pilly Lily. Oh, or, Lily. or Native Ribery, often gets called. This one, this one's Acmena smithii. But yeah. Well, I'll have to try one of the berries. <laughs> yeah. It's in yeah. season at the moment. So. Yeah, they're, I think they're looking a little bit, they've been on there a bit long now, I think, because we had them a couple of weeks ago, we had a bunch of kids. Um, so another quick one we'll show you, which is a really interesting one. This one's called a bulbine lily. And we grow these for a couple of reasons. One reason is, is that these flower heads, uh, our native bees, particular a couple of solitary bees, absolutely love them. So they come in and pollinate the site. But the other thing is, is that um, it's an interesting story around this. So they're often called the native leek. And it's because of this sort of fleshy, um, look at these fleshy oh, leaves. Lovely leaves. Yeah, yeah now, now don't eat those, Barbara, because uh, <laughs> The problem with native leek, and we assume that it was probably an English botanist to describe the visit to native leek, is, is that everything above the ground is toxic. Oh. We actually call it the wild onion. So on the base of this of this plant, you get these you get these tubers, which have this really bitter sort of onion type taste. It's a tuber that we use to cook with. Um, so yeah, so it's quite interesting. So food food for the uh, food for the uh, insects up above here, um, but don't definitely want to eat it. And calling it native leek is quite quite um, Quite, quite misleading. So, okay. yeah. So that's that, that's interesting. And bulbine leaves are getting really easy to grow again. Um, again, I mean, one of the things we're sort of been looking at is is that a lot of people know the fruits, but I mean, we're interested in sort of expanding the palate into some of the tubers and the vegetables, um, so that there's a sort of a broader use. And then the the idea of some of these gardens also is is that we want to see more people producing their own or accessing um, sustainable um, resources because in many cases some of these species as they become popular. Um, native resources that are actually being overextended. So wild resource collections being overextended. So another one of our, uh, well actually, no, I'll show you this one. This is called a chocolate lily. It's beautiful, isn't yeah, it? It's yeah. so delicate. Now if you smell them. It's absolutely beautiful. Smell them, now if you smell that Barbie, you'll smell the smell just like chocolate. Oh, yum. Yeah, so they smell like chocolate. Mm. Great little pollinator. Um, Look, the flowers are edible. So are a number of the number of native flowers, native violets. The thing I say about native flowers is is that um, they're edible. They don't taste that good. They pretty much taste like grass. Um, they look good on the They look good, though. but that's the thing. Edible flowers means you can eat them. Do you want to eat them? Probably the only exception to that is, and it's not so much the flower; it's the calyx of the rosella, which is the native hibiscus. Um, Technically, the rosella is not a native to Australian because it originally came from South Africa, but it's been here for such a long time that it's what we call a naturalised species. So it's still regarded. You've probably had it before in, in the, they have the calyxes, which is the part under the flower in syrup, um, and you usually put them in your champagne. You've probably seen those native hibiscus. Probably some people out there have had them before. Um, so another little interesting one here, I'll we'll turn around. This is the native parsnip. Wow. And the reason I call it a parsnip is not so much of its shape or taste, but actually the texture of the... So again, it's a root tuber, um, high in starch, really interesting um, plant. It has these amazing flower spikes. There's probably a few over there. There's these little balls. I often call it the firecracker plant because it just looks like exploding firecrackers on top of it. <coughs> but again, a plant people don't know much about. We've got a number of them here in the garden. Um, the idea is is to sort of create these um, compatible garden spaces where certain plants work together. Um, but yeah, these these um, native parsnips are going really well. Um, that's probably most of the ones that we can show at the moment. Oh, the Davo. That's right. I've been reminded. <coughs> Excuse me. I need to find my water bottle. So what did the kids think of the garden today? Oh, they loved it. <coughs> Excuse me. I've just eaten that um, bit of sea celery and now it's going down my throat. Actually, I can't grab my water bottle. <coughs> this is actually quite a big place. We don't realize it. I'm going to get at least to do a little bit of a zoom now. At least, do you want to just kind of zoom around so people get, can get a sense of what we're doing? It is a warm you day, see? but it's beautiful. <coughs> oh, I went down the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, 
this is a good one. Around the shade. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I swallow that down the wrong way. Only problem in Sydney at the moment, if you cough, 100 people run away. Oh, yeah. <coughs> excuse me. So this is um, Davison Plum, Rainforest Plum. <coughs> and I can't get that out of my throat. <laughs> a really interesting plant. <coughs> the fruit actually grow on the stem of the plant. And they are really, <coughs> excuse me, bitter and sour plant. How big do they get? Um, and like it's the large size of a large plum. Oh wow! Yeah, and these trees can get quite large too. Yeah. So they love they love a shady spot. <clears throat> and then next to them we've got growing these endogophora, which are uh, like a legume. So they actually fix nitrogen to the soil. Mm -hmm. So they a lot of these plants in this area love love. And they get a beautiful. It's called a uh, native indigo. Um, you can use the flowers for making a dye. Um, but they're really good if you've got things like finger limes or other fruiting trees, native trees. You plant these near them and then they help feed nitrogen into the into the food system so that the plants um, get larger fruit. And you've got a beautiful blue flower. Yep, yep, yep. They've got a beautiful blue flower from the uh, pink blue flowers in the cupboard and they can use them for a dye. But yeah, we've got a number of um, Davisons in here, sort of, that, and they'll get quite large and sort of fill the space in the shady areas as well because it is pretty uh, hot and warm in Sydney today. Excuse me for my coughing fit. It's always the way, isn't it? So Nathan, if people wanted to purchase these plants, where do they go? So we, we work with a couple of um, uh, indigenous companies. So in DigiGrow, if you actually wanted to buy seedlings um, to grow a number of these plants plus other uh, native food species plants, uh, in DigiGrow is a social enterprise. It's at La Perouse here in Sydney. Um, Pete Cooley and them are a fantastic organisation. They work with young people, getting them involved in learning about how propagating plants and learning about native plants, young Indigenous people. So um, if you look up their website in DigiGrow, you can actually order their plants online. <laughs> and the great thing about natives is if you get tube stock, they grow really quickly. So you only got to buy a small plant, buy a few small plants. As far as um, food supplies, I mean, one of the things is um, very important and one of the things that we're working on at the moment is is working with different food suppliers around ethical supply of native ingredients and actually trying to bring more indigenous owned companies into the bush food market. <clears throat> Currently it's about a hundred million dollars a year the bush food market in Australia um, and only two percent of that is 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 coming from indigenous owned companies. Yeah and there's actually quite a bit of unethical uh, stuff happening where Companies are representing themselves as, you know, almost being Aboriginal when they're not, or First Nations when they're not. So there's this whole thing about ethical supply. So we're working with um, the National uh, Bush Food and uh, National Indigenous Bush Food and um, Native Food Alliance. And the idea is that we are able to create, create a network of Indigenous suppliers so that it can be ethical supply, but also benefit for communities. So, and then in Digi Earth is a, is a, is a local supplier in Mudgee here in New South Wales. She, she has amazing foods if you're looking for um, produce, but also here locally, Marrickville, we work a lot with Two Providors, is another place you can get some amazing, um, amazing different um, native produce that comes from across Australia. So for all of your uh, nutritional and cooking ex exploits. Cool. Have we got any? Oh uh, yeah, mm -hmm. we had a we had a question in the chat. Um, just to repeat the name of the legume plant again. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. and it's it's called native indigo. Native indigo, right? And, and endigofra, endigo, endigofra is the scientific name. And that's the one that can fix the oxygen. Ah, uh, sorry, nitrogen in the. Yeah, yeah. So it works like a legume and fixes fixes nitrogen and great companion plant, especially for finger limes, mm -hmm. uh, any sort of heavy fruiting native plants that need that nitrogen. And they look fantastic. As I said, and if you're into, into art, you can, you can make dye from the flowers. Wow. We also had another question if you were aware of any companies based in North Queensland, but I think Tracy could help with that question later. Yeah, 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 she could. I mean, the great thing is, is I think the key is, is just taking the time to, to, to talk to them or, or at least and get in par with them about <coughs> if they're Indigenous owned or is there Indigenous community benefit? Because in many cases, they're taking these species. <coughs> Excuse me out of the bush mm. and we'd rather see that they don't do that and then, then that's a more sustainable practice and then that's led by communities in the local area. Mm. 
Uh, we had <coughs> another question just regarding um, this is like a rain garden, right? So how, how does the water system work for this garden that makes it so sustainable? Uh, cool. <coughs> so the rain garden actually works as a biofilter for the site. So this creek that's up through here, this creek bed that's up through here, um, is a design that we've that we've sort of come up with. And what it was is that the Aboriginal community wanted to have certain species, which is some of the species you see here, um, the grass species, the species they use for um, weaving. <clears throat> so we had a drainage issue on the site. So the idea is is that the, the water is actually filtered through the through the soil, but by, filtered through the rhizomes of the of the plants. So the fibrous root systems. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how it is. And it's not so much that the water is fed into it. So the whole site here uses uh, recycled water, but this particular site is, is, is more about actually water quality because what you used to have here in, in um, Redfern and South Everly used to be ephemeral swamps. So you used to have fresh water, water bodies all through here that are all um, drainage areas and swamp areas. And so the water runs down through this site and takes a lot of <coughs> rubbish and silt and things like that. So then you have to, we looked at one of the slow the water down and you can do this in your garden. But the great thing about it is there are species that like that type of environment where they can actually use that process to be able to grow. And so that's how we can grow. And so this is essentially was a, a, a test of how we could do it. And we're looking at doing this on large scales, like doing large drainage areas that are up to a couple of kilometers long. Um, Cause normally they use biofilter gardens and rain gardens. They use particular species that, you know, look a bit ugly and it's a bit monocultural. So. You know, if you didn't know, if we didn't point it out, you probably wouldn't know it was here. But I mean, that whole area through there is a big drainage issue. Now the water that leaves this site is is essentially clean. That's really good. Uh, and just, I guess, one last question before we move to Tracy. If we um, were a beginner gardener, what kind of plants would you recommend um, to grow? Up? Ah, so the old, the, old, the old question of what plants can I not kill? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, look for food, for food. Um, Warrigal greens. I mean, you're probably everybody's probably familiar with Warrigal greens. They're like a native spinach really? oh, soup. Well, super, so. super high in vitamin C. Mm. Um, the problem with Warrigal greens, if you plant them somewhere, make sure you can contain them because once you've got them, they go there. And you'll see them in your coastal environment. Um, the key with them is they've got, um, you know, like most spinaches, is a strong oxalate. So you need to, we usually blanch them or, you know, you need to cook them or, um, Rinse them thoroughly so you take some of that oxalate off because obviously if you eat too much of it, you get kidney stones. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> fantastic. So they're, they're really easy to grow. Um, River mint, which is a native mint. It's just really, really sweet and bubblegummy sort of, you mm. know, catnippy type mint. Very sweet. We've got some of that on the roof. We haven't got it down here yet. But because um, we haven't put it down here because again, it goes crazy, just like mint, but beautiful, beautiful. And then you get what's called native mint sometimes. But we call it native thyme. It's called is Prostanthera. Um, it does get called native mint sometimes, but if you look for Prostanthera, and it has this beautiful smell, and it's almost got almost like a an oily eucalyptus property to it. But it gets used a lot um, in cooking of meat. Um, so there, look, they're, they're ones that you can. I mean, most natives once the first they get through the first year, once they're established, they're pretty hardy. Um, I think it's a. I think it can be a bit of a myth that people think that natives are really hard to grow. I mean, it's sort of. But yeah, some of the, when you bring ones from out of country, I mean, I always, look, the one thing too is to go to your native, once you know some species, the edible species that you're interested in, you go to your, your native nursery that's nearby you and see what they're growing too is always a really good, a really good way to look at what you might better grow in your area. But as I said, a lot of these species, I've got them growing home in pots and just because during COVID, we had to have some, some greenery in the townhouse. So I'm moving out of the city soon, thank God. So <laughs> at, at 30, 30 acres of farm, hopefully. <laughs> Okay. Here we go. I just wanted to ask, you also have a shop uh, as part of your gardens and I see you all wearing your t-shirts. Do you want to tell us a little oh. bit about that? Yeah, so we sort of got into this whole thing of, you know, you've got to, got to share your identity. And I suppose as a startup, we, we, we've got quite a lot of um, interest, which is great. So, so yeah, so on our website, we've got, we've got shirts that help fund some of our projects. Um, more recently, uh, we're in the whole botanical sense. During COVID, we decided that we needed to have a bit of a project. Um, it was one of those conversations, me talking to a couple of mates about how much we dislike the smell of beard oil, because it's always very, very perfumed and so forth and not very blakey. 
Um, and then we, we were looking at some of the plants that we love the smell of. So through a collaboration through a friend of ours distilling oil, we've come out with Yurang Beard Oil, which is all native botanical oils. Um, fantastic for your skin and for your beard. But the other thing is, is that uh, my partner now and other girls have started using it as serum, even though it's, it's got a very strong, we use cypress pine um, and butterwood, which is a false sandalwood oils, um, as well as another other, a number of other um, natural oils. Um, has very, really it's that nice, beautiful smell of like the bush just after it's rained and things like that. So um, yeah, and we're always always working on different ideas and then working with other collaborators to, to come up with new products and new ideas. That sounds terrific, thank you. That sounds terrific, thank you. Now, Nathan, just one more question for you. How can we help? What can we do as a community to um, foster a little bit more, promote a bit more what you're doing? Because this is absolutely marvelous. And I suspect not many people know about it. Nutrition Australia and New South Wales, or people on the Zoom, if they're interested, what do we do? How do we contact you? Um, well, obviously you can come through our, our website. Um, but I think the key is, is, is bringing nutritional value from, from native foods. I think, I mean, we always talk about food as being medicine. I mean, the interesting thing is, I think there's lots of well-being both physically and mentally through engaging with native plants. So I think that's a great opportunity for, you know, is, is that, that food has this, this fantastic well-being um, outcome. So I think and also planting native plants in your area, you know, is, is great for biodiversity. Yeah. I think what we love about food and, and we do native cocktail courses and, and other things is, is that it also brings people together and they have the opportunity to learn about um, First Nation Indigenous culture um, around eating or around and I think that's great because it's breaking down lots of barriers. And, and I think these days it's very good because there's a lot of um, correlation between different cultures. And I think that's what we've found great is we've done a lot of collaborations with um, different chefs where it's a mix of their culture and our culture that comes out on the plate. And I think it's great for conversations. It's great for sharing knowledge. And I think it's a great way for people to, to understand and access more about Indigenous culture. And then, but also similarly for us to be able to share with them as well. All right. Thank you. Well, look, I think we will leave it there. Nathan, once again, on behalf of Nutrition Australia and New South Wales, can I thank you? And can I thank all your team at Nerebing... How do you say it? Nerebing... Yerebingen. 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 Like it's like yeah. Paul McCartney, you say. <laughs> I'm singing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so very much for, for inviting us and giving us this tour today. We really appreciate it very much. Uh, and we will now go on to our next segment uh, with Tracy, who is now going to show us all the amazing things that she's going to do with her cooking. So um, Tracy Hardy is one of Australia's uh, few Aboriginal accredited practicing dietitians and the owner of Wattle Seed Nutrition. So with that, Tracy, a very warm welcome to you. I hope you enjoyed watching us tour this wonderful garden. For those of you who haven't been here, please contact us. Um, and if you want to know more, contact us or, or contact um, uh, through the website and we will get you some information. Uh, once again, Nathan, um, Elise, thank you very much. And over to you, Tracy. Uh -huh. Thanks so much, Barbara. Yama, everyone, how are you? Um, my name's Tracy. I just wanted to say thank you too to Chris. I was, I've been fangirling over Yarrabinga and, and watching everything that's been happening on social media for a long time um, with Yarrabinga and it's on my wish list and bucket list to come down and visit the garden, have a yarn once these borders and everything open. So really, really exciting stuff to watch and thank you for sharing. So look, just before I start today too, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and traditional custodians on the unceded lands of the Gallagher, uh, Gallagher people of the Aurora Nation and also pay respects to the traditional owners and custodians on the lands I'm speaking from today on Gubby Gubby Kali Kali country and also extend that to all of you who are you know um, joining us today and you know who are working towards being allies in fighting for a just equitable and fair Australia. So I'm doing a bit of a cook up and one of my brief it's, it's going to be hard because anyone who knows me, I know Nikki there, so I can see her. They know I like to have a bit of a yarn. So getting this in half an hour, I'm trying to go to try, really try. So Barbie might have to keep me in line. Um, my brief was, I'm just going to read it out because I will explain why I'm probably going to go a little bit what people wouldn't think, is um, 
is to explain, you know, the native benefit, ingredient taste, health benefits and how everyday Australians can use them in our health um, cooking. So when I talk about the health benefits, I'm not just going to talk about the biochemical and nutritional health benefits. I'm going to talk about it from that holistic perspective. And that's how we look at health. And that's something I think that we can all share together as well and benefit from. So um, I'm prepping today a really easy um, dish called tuna chickpea patties with bush tucker curry native dukkha and seeds. So um, I have forwarded this on to the nutrition um, team down in New South Wales. So if you did want to have a look at it, I'm sure they'll be able to send it out. Oh, yep, there we are. Got it there. <laughs> um, so yeah, go ahead and help yourself to it. It's really easy. It's really nutritious. One of the reasons why I wanted to go with this recipe as well is that I always do a lot of workshops and I talk about our traditional ways of eating being really rich and diverse in fiber and seeds and nuts and tubers and plant-based um, vegetables and herbs, etc., as well as a lot of lean meats as well. So this one is kind of, you know, we might not be able to live how we did, how old people and um, ancestors did traditional ways, but we can sort of respect them and show that respect to them, their resilience in our old peoples and our people today of being able to share that knowledge and be able to replicate that um, in today's society. So we're going to be doing a root-based vegetable with the sweet potato. I'm going to be using um, a lot of all those what we talked about with that diversity and fiber. So we've got um, a side dish of salsa which has got tomatoes and we've got warrigal greens we've got um capsicum we've got cucumber we've got celery and we've got um sustainably sourced um salmon um tuna sorry so i'm going to try and do two things at once because apparently that's what we can do really well as women um and talk through what i know or what i've learned and over time as well and share that with you all it's important for me to, when I'm talking about this, to just put a disclaimer out that um, this, when I talk about the health benefits of this, it's it's just general. So if you have a condition or anything like that, you do need to see, you know, get personalised um, advice on that. And also let everyone know that I'm just speaking from my land experience. Um, I was on the working party for the um, working group that established the um, First Nations Bush Foods and Botanicals Alliance with helping put all that together. So I've been really, really lucky and privileged to have so many amazing people who've been in that industry for decades who are sharing that and because they want that to be passed on to generations as well. So without any further ado, we're using the um, sweet potato. Now in the recipe, I've actually um, said that you can just give it a gentle steam. I've, I've actually done it a little bit different because you know, I like to mix things up a bit. And I've actually popped the uh, sweet potato in whole in the oven, uh, just put a little split in the top and I let it bake on about 180 degrees for about an hour. And then you can just mash it all up in the um, bowl there. And what that does is it helps to keep all those nutrients in there without them leaching out into water. And you can also keep the skin on too. So you're gonna get the extra fiber. So when I was talking about old ways of eating and um, you know, being quite fibrous, um, etc. When we're talking about health, we also not we also need to think about that health for our mother earth because if she's not well, we're not well. And so when I talk about these and sustainable sourced fish, you know, if we're over farming those fish supplies, we're not going to be able to take that. And old ways was doing was like, you know, you only take what you need, you don't waste. Um, and you take you take, pay attention to the season that's in as well. So sweet potatoes, um, pretty much in Australia, are in season all year round. So you're reducing those food miles, and you're also going to reduce those emissions that go with that too. So this is such an easy recipe. <laughs> you can't go wrong. And I've gone all flash, and I've gone and prepared it all before. Um, so there's a chef's term for that. I have been taught that, but I can't remember what it is. So I've got everything prepared, so it won't take too long because I thought it'll make maybe allow a little bit more time to um, for people to ask questions. One of the, I'm just going to throw all the bits and pieces in. I'll bring you down here so you can see what's happening. Okay, so as I said, here's some I prepared earlier, and I will. There are steps in this which require this 
once it's prepared to be baked or like sitting in the um, fridge for about an hour before you bake it. So I've actually pre-prepared some of these before so you can see the end result. You know, full master chef Maggie beers, I'm, I'm following suit. So we've got your um, sweet potato, really rich in fiber, good um, starchy veg. So it's gonna give you energy. It's got a good source of carbohydrates in there. Your brain basically needs carbohydrates to function. So there's, don't believe all the hype from some people that, you know, carbs are bad because they aren't. You need them to function, they give you energy. So I've just got some um, sustainably sourced uh, tuna here. If you're curious to know um, what sort of Tuna is most sustainable. Greenpeace did release a report um, on rating the most sustainable to the least as well. So that might be a good place to go and look up and access that as well. I'm actually not going to say any brands because I don't think I should. I don't think that will probably be allowed to. So I'm just keeping it very generic. So I've got to um, just pop that in there as well. Mix that together a bit. What I do, I'm using a fork, you can use a masher, whatever you, you choose. What I'm using to flavour this particular dish, um, I actually am using, uh, I'll do my full influencer thing now. I'm not, this is not sponsored. It's, I just like to, like um, Christian was saying, I like to support indigenous led enterprises because there are disparities with that, the profits coming from that of who they're going to. And we know that food insecurity, one of the underpinning uh, determinants of that is socioeconomic status. So, you know, being able to support our indigenous led enterprises helps to improve that and improve our health outcomes from that perspective as well. So I've actually got this, um, I've got two types of curries. I've got one that's been developed by, it's a bush curry by, Murnong Mummers, they are um, a Victorian based company. And I've also got a really good friend who happens to be a chef and he's developing his own brand. So this is, this is something I've been pestering him for for a very long time. So he's given me a trial run just to um, share with you guys, but hopefully he will run these out soon. So this is by a company called Three Little Birds. That's a native dukkha that I'll be using as well. And so I'm actually going to use his today because I've used Murnong Mother's Mummers before and it tasted amazing. So I'm actually going to use Chris's today. Normally what I would do with most of these sort of curry spices, I'd give them a little bit of a, a gentle heat in a pan just to sort of release those um, flavours and to sort of get rid of that real, you know, uncooked, curry sort of taste that we're all very familiar with. It doesn't taste very pleasant. So I've actually done that before and I've already got some in like on the side here. So I'm gonna put two tablespoons of that in because I like a little bit of oomph to the flavor. One of the other things I'm going to include as well is uh, I'm actually going to use the, uh, I know that Chris was talking about the ruby salt bush and I have actually got both the ruby salt bush and old moon salt bush growing here in my urban home. So I've actually just recently pruned back my ruby though. So I'm actually using um, some of my old man salt bush, which I have already dehydrated and ground up. So I'm going to pop about a good tablespoon of that in there as well. And I'm also going to be using another indigenous led Enterprises product. It's by My Dilly Bag and it's just their wild salt and pepper mix. So they've got some salt bush in here and mountain pepper that's been ground up. And the reason why I like using uh, salt bush is when I do a lot of workshops, I sort of um, talk about um, swapping out your sodium, like your table salt that you'd normally use and you're swapping it in for salt bush. And the reason why is that, you know, it has been reported that salt bush actually contains about 20% less sodium than table salt. And it's actually really rich in um, antioxidants. So you're going to get that yummy, salty, herby sort of flavor without those um, uh, sodium, without that sodium level in it that is in our table salt, which if we have too much, which as a nation we are having too much, it can actually cause problems with your heart, 
in, in Hardenia art trees, etc. So swapping that out for salt bush is a really nice alternative for that, you know, both as a preventative measure as well as, um, you know, a chronic condition management um, practice as well. So I've mixed all that in there and that smells amazing already. And to replicate further, old ways of eating, you know, we talked about, you know, rich in tubers, nuts, seeds, lean uh, fish and, you know, flavourings like this. I'm actually going to be adding in order a cup of uh, pepita seeds, uh, which have got rich of those healthy fats in there as well. So you're going to get all those extra benefits as well as um, that diversity in fibre. So it has been reported that you know, we talk about gut health and that to, you know, ensure that we have a good, you know, healthy gut environment, that we, it's kind of, you know, it's just okay. So our gut is made up of like a whole diversity. It's like this ecosystem of parasites, bacteria, microorganisms, etc. So they're all really diverse and they all feed off the prebiotics, they're called. So when those are the fibers that don't digest in your gastrointestinal tract and they end up in your lower bowel. And then all those different um, gut microbiome, they feed on all those different type of uh, what they then become probiotics in the gut. Uh, so we need to have to include, ensure that we have a, you know, feeding all of those healthily, we need to provide as many diverse varieties of different kinds of fibers. Now, interestingly, I was, I do quite a lot of lectures and I run a series of workshops called Gathering, Cooking and Eating with Deep Listening. And so I go into this a little bit more when I do those workshops. But at the moment, you know, when you're looking at how our, you know, I'll come back up here so you can see me. Um, there's a real concern at the moment with the current food system not being able to sustain the population growth by 2050. And so they have this international agreement that people sign up for that calls sustainable development goals to help address that. At the moment, when you're looking at the current food system and how it's, why it's not going to be enough to sustain it, just, and that apart from the fact of the diversity, I looked at a, looked a bit of research and there's, I'll read this out to you, it's pretty cool. No, it's not actually, it's pretty shocking. So there's 7,000 plant species used as food in the world but 150 are considered commercial. Then there's 103 which species which provide 90% of the food we eat. Three of those species, that's wheat, rice and maize, produce 50% of all the calories consumed by humans. So when you think about that, that's not a lot of diversity that's happening there. And it's, you know, quite the main majority of what we're eating is there's, it's pretty limited in its diversity. So these ways we can, you know, by replicating old ways and increasing our own diversity, we can sort of improve that diversity of that gut microbiome as well. And just for curiosity's sake too, we've got 6,500 bush foods in Australia that's been found identified and at the moment, and only about 20 have been developed for commercial markets. And I'll follow on too from what Christian was saying, like, and of those commercial markets, most of those are, are not led by Indigenous led enterprises. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work being in place at the moment to try and ensure that the knowledge is that, uh, enabling those enterprises to happen are being protected and, you know, that biopiracy doesn't, um, it, you know, occur, etc. So it's something that we can work together and, again, like Chris was saying, supporting our Indigenous enterprises and if they're not, you know, asking the question, you know, how is that benefit going back to community? So we can have that bit more of equity and fairness and justice within the food system. So let's go back into preparing. So I've just thrown all that in there. Basically, I add in the corn, some chopped up chives, and the warrigal greens. I've actually, my warrigal greens are looking a little bit, how's your father, out the back. So I've actually mixed up my warrigal greens with some of my, I've got some silver beet. I have my own veggie patch at the moment, asserting my own food sovereignty, growing my own food that's seasonal and no waste as well. I use um, compost, so it's reducing food waste, which is, you know, 
contributing to our greenhouse emissions. So like Chris was saying, uh, Warrigal Greens is really rich in vitamin C, but it's also rich in um, iron as well. And it's also high in fiber. But just always remember that, like Chris is saying, that give it a blanch first. So normally when I'm cooking, like what I've done there, I'll have my Warrigal Greens sitting in a bowl just with some boiled water on it and giving it a chance to um, draw out those oxalates because you don't want too many of those Otherwise, you'll end up with kidney stones, which we don't want. Okay, so basically, that's it with that. So you just mix all that together. And you can add an egg in as well. You're going to get that, you know, with the seeds, they're great in fibre, but they've also got good sources of omegas and also got protein in them as well. Your egg's got your protein in it too. This is a really good one if you want to um, get the kids involved because you can't really go wrong. They can get in there with their hands if they want to, um, you know, and have a chat about what you've learnt about the foods that are going in there. It's something that I always encourage people to do. You like, uh, like Chris was saying, like food for me is a really great way of um, bridging under, uh, deepening understanding and navigating stereotypes and deepening respect and relationships between and within cultures and because it's not threatening it's exciting like say you know we go to let's say we go to Italy people will think oh we think pasta if you go to Mexico you think tacos and if you go to Australia what do you think about nine times out of ten people won't be thinking about our, our bush foods which are have sustained our mob since time memorial and kept them healthy and strong. So if you look at any of the photos, you know, back in the day, way, 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 way back, not long after colonization of our, you know, ancestors and old people, they were thriving, they were lean, they were healthy, they were well. I have a bit of a, a dad's joke where our, fa our ancestors fast food had legs. Whereas today's fast food, you need to get in the car and drive through a drive through So <laughs> I was sort of, um, I know, dad joke. So it's a, a really good way of trying to reconnect and understand and appreciate that, you know, Australia is home to the oldest living culture in the world. And that's something that we should take pride in as a, as a, as a nation. And the reality is that as a nation, we're eating too much sugar, we're eating too much salt. We are importing more food. I've got, um, I normally do a, a graph that I have there, but I did the research on what we're spending our money on. We're more and more spending money on importing foods. More and more money is being spent on takeouts and buying food out. So we're losing that connection with our food and where it comes from and how we are eating it and how we are preparing it. And when you think about that and the gut brain axis and that impact that it has on our, you know, our mental health with reconnecting to our food and our gut health is also being fueled by the fiber, you're going to benefit from all. And, you know, when the reality is that, yes, we have food uh, insecurity being experienced by our remote Aboriginal communities that's comparable to sub-Saharan Africa, which in those sustainable development goals has been reported as a crisis. Um, we, the reality is that humanity itself is, is going to be facing that food insecurity risk. So tapping into that knowledge, Indigenous knowledges across the world are being recognised as being important and vital to be able to find ways of having more sustainable um, agricultural practices and people are working together to help make that happen. So it's, it's something that I think we can actually do individually. People go, well, what can I do as an individual? And I said, well, you can actually connect with the traditional owners or custodians on the land you're from, ask them about what that is, buy the food, grow it at home. I've got, um, I know Peter from Indigigo and I've actually got, there's a young, um, two young fellas down in Sydney called uh, Working at Bush to Bowl and they are actually posting me up a whole big box of like seedlings as well so I can grow those and then you can share that knowledge and with your children so they then also respect it as well but, and also need understand the no need to protect it. So what I've done here is I've just got my dukkha and I'm only going to do one or two because I'm mindful about time. But it's really simple. You just kind of make them into sort of 
good sized patties. I'm going to say about the palm of about the palm of your hand. You can go bigger if you want. You can go smaller. It's up to you. I like to keep them quite round. And then you just roll it in the dukkha. So this dukkha, it's got uh, lemon myrtle. It's got uh, macadamia nuts. It's got wattle seed, which is a really good source of protein. Um, it's also a low GI food as well. So it's good if you have wanting to monitor your, uh, you know, if you have people who uh, are experiencing diabetes and wanting to manage that as well. So that is that. So it's as simple as that and there's keep on going the process and then you basically give them a two minute shallow fry on each side and then whack them in the oven. But first you need to leave them rest in the fridge for about an hour just so they can get a bit firm when you're cooking them. And then what you end up with So you'll end up with a beautiful um, like patty that's coming out like that. You can freeze these as well. So you can do these in bulk and have them um, in the fridge ready to go. Most of the food here is like shelf, like shelf ready. I've actually got the tomatoes and the silver beet from my own garden as well, as well as the cucumbers. And then all you can do is like make yourself up a little like salsa with some tomatoes. Throw some cucumber in there, some red onion, mix it together with some um, lovely fresh lime juice. So you're gonna get that beautiful vitamin C. I actually prefer to use finger limes, but um, I've used them all. So you can, I use finger limes in mine because they give you those beautiful pops of caviar, which is absolutely delicious. And also some coriander. If you like coriander, I love it. So I pop that in there. So you're going to get all those, look at all that, just that one dish. You've got all those different plant diversity in there as well. And what I usually do too, is I'll get my, you know, when we talk about having it as another side, having your your yogurt, so that making sure you choose a yogurt that's got live bacteria in it, so they like your probiotics, so they'll actually survive your digestive tract and help to fuel that healthy gut as well. So I get my yogurt, some garlic, which I've lightly um, fried just to give it the nice flavour and not raw. A little lemon juice. You've got that on the side. It's a lovely healthy dressing. Got a good source of calcium in there as well, good source of protein. And voila! So that is my beautiful plant-based, well I like like plant well, it's pretty much predominantly plant-based. So when you say plant-based, it's not 100%, but, you know, using your meat as a side. So this is my plant-based meal, which has got all those beautiful, different diversity of um, fibres in it. It's also got probiotics in there as well, rich in those, um, you know, low in sodium, high in protein, just delicious. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy, very much. That was wonderful. It looks so yummy and you're making me hungry. Um, <laughs> it, looks, it looks great. Now, will you be able to share your wonderful recipe with us? Absolutely. Um, I have emailed it over. Do you want me to... Um, um, it Selena. Up? Yeah, look, Selena will pass it on to me. That would okay. be great. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, look, this is fantastic. I hope you enjoyed today's um, The Garden, the tour, and also watching Tracy. Tracy has not only shown us what she can cook, but also has given us some amazing tips as well as some history lesson um, uh, about our One Nation people. Sustainable food is the way for our future. And as a country and as a state, we need to empower each other to not only eat healthier right now, 
by filling our plates with fresh products or whole foods, but also to ensure our food supply and environment is preserved for generations to come. Now, remember our theme this, this year is My Plate, My Planet, Try for Five. We have got another event on this Friday. If you can join us, that will be terrific at, at 6 p.m. We will have the Australia's Master Chef, um, Callum Ham, who will be doing a cook-up for us. Um, Minister for Federal Minister for Indigenous um, Affairs, um, Ken Wyatt AL, Warren Mundine AL, um, and Nicole Turner on the panel. So that should be really another amazing um, evening that we will have and remember on Friday also is World uh, Food Day. Um, we will celebrate together and remember what we need to do. Um, once again, my plate, my pa pa planet, just forgetting there, uh, sustainable food and vegetables. Tracy, once again, thank you very much. And everyone, thank you so much for being here today. Can I say a special hi to Jenny, um, who's on on here today jenny i hope you enjoyed it and i know tracy talked about low gi so that should be music to your ears and also to jeremy wright who is joining us jeremy a very warm welcome to you and once again thank you all for being here and we hope to see you on friday thank you Bye. <laughs>